Yoga arrived in the West during the 1800s and began to turn into a multi-million dollar industry with the founding of Core Power Yoga. Core Power Yoga, starting in 2002, hitched yoga to capitalism, undoing the central and cultural aspects of the practice. The way in which Core Power aims to teach and spread yoga is diminishing to some of the aspects of yoga and in effect has changed how yoga is practiced and viewed in the West today. Core Power Yoga has boiled yoga down into a set of asanas without fate, devotion, or understanding underlying it. But to understand how yoga truly has transformed, it is important to first take a look at the roots of yoga. Yoga has an origin that dates back thousands of years ago, long before the first religions or belief systems were born. The word yoga was first mentioned in ancient texts called the Rig Veda. Yoga is one of the six schools of philosophy in Hinduism and a major part of Buddhism as well. There are four types of yoga, Gyan Yoga or knowledge, Bhakti Yoga or devotion, Karma Yoga or action, or Dhyanya Yoga for concentration, this through which people achieve moksha. Achieving moksha is the ultimate goal according to Hinduism and is defined as the release from the cycle of rebirth, impelled by the law of karma. Yoga is practiced in order to complete oneself, creating the same unified divine by letting go of the materialist individual. It loosens the tie of the ego and of desire. Yoga is an approach to life that helps us better understand ourselves and our relationship to the world and to reach oneness with God. Over a century ago, the practice of yoga we see today made its way over to the West. The yoga we see today started with the arrival of an Indian monk who, after traveling for five years in India, arrived in the West. Swami Vivekananda was the first to speak on yoga in the West during the World's Parliament of Religions Interfaith Conference in 1893 held in Chicago. The conference was held during the Massive World's Columbian Exposition. The yoga that Vivekananda presented to American audiences was different from the versions we generally see practiced today in the West. Vivekananda largely spoke of yoga as a matter of philosophy, psychology, and self-improvement. Vivekananda's approach did not encompass asanas. When he spoke and wrote to America about yoga, there was little agreement as to what yoga actually was. Many took yoga as something being magical, when it was really a type of diet, system of mental concentration, or breathing techniques. A key figure in shaping yoga as we see today in the West was Swami Kulia Ananda. He started research on yoga in 1920, and he had a profound influence on the development of yoga as an exercise. It was really during the 1920s and 1930s that yoga obtained a higher profile in America. Indian immigrants began to spread yoga, and it also began to gain popularity because of the vegetarian movements. By the end of the 1930s, the revival of Hatha Yoga in India made its way to the West, and yoga began to solidify into its postures and physical exercises. Health and bodybuilding magazines began to start promoting yoga on cupboards and adding asanas to their classes. Yoga in the 1960s really began to boom in the West, and starting with the early 1960s, several Americans such as Richard Hittleman and Lilius Follin used television to present approachable and practical forms of yoga to a larger audience. Later in that decade, members of the hippie counterculture and the New Age movement popularized yoga further and founded many of its institutions that have allowed for its growth. A stream of Hindu religious life came to the United States, which made the term guru, or spiritual leader, a household term. Among the first to arrive was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who became the guru of the Beatles and started the Students International Meditation Society in 1965. He was the first to popularize transcendental meditation. Many Americans embraced the simple and accessible meditation routine in their fast-paced and stress-filled lives. Swami Sachin Ananda was another leader who helped shape yoga in the United States. He spoke at Woodstock in 1969 and later taught yoga at his Yogaville ashram in Ruler, Virginia. In 1969, Swami Rama came to the United States and demonstrated voluntary bodily control of yoga at the research department of the Meninger Foundation. He started a foundation in order to bring the East and West together in the practice of holistic health and yoga. By the 1980s and the 1990s, the introduction of the VHS tapes and DVDs and the rise of fitness industry led to yoga becoming a part of the routine of countless Americans. Though yoga has gained recognition as a tool for spiritual well-being, its commercialization has largely reduced it to a system of exercise of the mind and body.
Today, yoga is largely misunderstood and is practiced as primarily asana. Although asana has many benefits, it's not the goal or purpose of yoga. Asana is not meant for the physical fitness, but is intended for balancing energy in the body and learning to control the five elements. Yoga masters recognize the importance of asana because higher level of yoga cannot be achieved if the physical body is weak, sick, or injured. Asana is considered a starting point in yoga. It's only the physical aspect of yoga which helps purify the body in order to reach spiritual aspects and experience the true greatness of yoga. The founder and CEO of Core Power Yoga, Trevor Tice, found yoga after a devastating accident, which left him unable to do his routine physical activities such as mountain climbing and rowing. Tice, who would regularly travel for work, decided to start finding yoga studios in the cities he would end up in. He said that he found the facilities at the yoga studios he visited underwhelming and that it lacked delivery and consistency that any good customer experience would have. So Tice decided to found his own chain of yoga studios, which we now see all over the nation, Core Power Yoga. Core Power Yoga focuses on consistency and customer experience. Their studios have full rocker rooms and climate control, and the yoga taught at Core Power Studios is designed by Tice himself. It is a mixture of Power Yoga, Astanga Yoga, and Bikram Yoga. Core Power has turned to the country's largest yoga studio chain. The company has a distinct profitable approach by enlisting its teachers as salespeople and incentivizing them with bonuses. The company tells its instructors and managers how and when to push core power programming in class. The instructors are guided to give training pitches at the end of Savasana, which is the final resting pose. To bring students out of deep relaxation, instructors give what the company calls a personal share, tied to the classroom theme, like gratitude and their soul-rocking experience with core power. They enhance the selling skills of the instructors through video tutorials and tell them to single out students after class to push core power programming. In the videos, the instructors are given a specific script or system to follow when engaging with the potential enrollee. In a soft voice, the instructor would say, you've been coming to my class for two years. It just blows me away. This is the next phase in your evolution. The surprised student responds, me, really? I don't know if I would be a good teacher. The instructor then promptly disagrees and promises to send them more information on enrolling while conveniently leaving out the price of the program. Core Power Yoga has a tiered monetary incentives program for the instructors, which pushes the driving of this financially burdening program. Bonuses vary based on the type of class and the number of people they are able to convince into enrolling in the program. Internal documents show that teachers who lead trainings receive up to $1,000 for meeting their enrollment goals. Enrollment goals typically means enrolling 10 to 20 students. Other teachers earn $100 per sign up. Annual raises depend on how often they would pitch and get people to enroll in their programs. Current and former employees have said that training programs run three to four times a year at each location and the program earnings can account for up to a third of annual sales at each studio. In a court case filed against Core Power Yoga, an employee revealed the true nature of the company. One plaintiff, Effie Morgenstern, described it as a commercial enterprise that is hiding behind the guise of yoga. Another plaintiff, Melissa Brennan, states the company is profiting off their students, dragging human beings into trainer training, and then pouring out instructors, which simply dilutes the entire spirit of yoga. Sheetal Shah, who is the woman who launched the Take Back Yoga campaign, believes this goes in the very opposition of fundamental tenets of yoga, satya. Satya is a Sanskrit word that loosely translates to truth and essence. Satya refers to virtue in Hinduism, referring to being truthful in one's thought, speech, and actions. She says core power yoga is violating that through telling teachers to prey upon students who may also or might not be desirable as teachers and brings them in only for purpose of earning profits. Advertisements for Core Power Yoga are a cause for concern as well. Advertisements sell yoga as mainly a form of exercise and aims to enlist students into their pricey memberships for monetary gains. They sell memberships by promoting a two-week free trial with a $50 membership per month following that.
Many of their advertisements contain key words such as power. Power is not a word commonly associated with the practice of yoga, which shows how core power is yo selling yoga as a quick workout, which promises a lifestyle of peace and enlightenment. They are also selling a gendered ego, targeting primarily women of an upper middle class standing. In ads, mostly women are portrayed, and mainly white women at that. And now in order to reduce criticism, many of their ads do incorporate women and men of different ethnicities, but this, however, seems to be not reflective of the true demographic of the people who attend Core Power Yoga classes. Core Power Yoga has had a significant impact on how yoga is viewed in the West today, primarily boiling it down to a form of physical exercise, diminishing some of the cultural aspects of yoga. Despite that, Core Power Yoga has also managed to increase the following of yoga in the West to a scale that has never been seen before. Yoga, although being very different from its original practice, now has 36 million Americans practicing yoga regularly and approximately 300 million people worldwide. This introduction and spread of yoga can only be beneficial to the practitioners and will hopefully be able to release people of their ties to the ego and desire and be able to undermine American consumer capitalism. Yoga has the power to heal one from the within, leading people down a path of self-growth without them even knowing it. Yoga is one of those things is where you, it, you use it as a tool to uplift you, to move you in your life, to give you progression, to evolve you and it becomes this trans this underlying gift but also the secret of how am i going to evolve and how am i going to transform myself